Well, good afternoon, friends, and welcome to another edition of Live with the Staff. It's good to be with you on this uh, Thursday, April the 8th, and uh, to share with you a little bit of uh, truth and perhaps encouragement, hopefully encouragement from the scriptures. Uh, first of all, I uh, hope you're really enjoying the weather outside. Now it's a little dry out there, but uh, but we're really enjoying the warm temperatures and um, and the provision that God has for us in these days. And hopefully over Easter now, you've had an opportunity to remember the, the death of Jesus and to celebrate his resurrection from the grave, and that you've had an opportunity to be able to do that with, with family in different ways. I know that it's a little bit challenging these days for families to get together, but prayerfully you've been able to find a way to do that. Um, and so I just want to encourage you with that. Uh, yeah. Um, the other day I was scrolling through my Facebook page. I do that from time to time just to see what's happening. And I came across a post that identified an idea and an, an, an often misconception that believers seem to persist in hanging on to and even to spread to others. Uh, the post talked about the, the idea or the misconception that people have concerning God as never giving us more than we can handle. Now, I have no doubt that you've probably heard that somewhere or seen it, you know, written on a, on a, on a page somewhere that, that people are sharing with each other uh, that God will never give us more than we can handle. Uh, it's a little bit like saying, in a way, uh, God helps those who help themselves, thinking that that is a deep, deep biblical truth. But, uh, but these kinds of things have a way of popping up in places uh, and appear to be as, as deep biblical truth. Now, the question I want to answer this afternoon and, and, and maybe work through with us is, is that true, that God will never give us more than we can handle? Now, there are some people who will say, well, it's absolutely true, and it's, it's a well-meaning attempt to provide comfort to those who are suffering. But the question is, or the point is, if it's not true, uh, you need to be very careful with it because it'll do no good, first of all, and in fact, it can really damage one's understanding of God and one's relationship with God. So you really need to be careful in, in how you use that sort of, that sort of saying. Um, so where does this idea come from? And of course, is it true? Now, I had to think about this. You know, does God give us, does God never give us more than we can handle? Well, let's, let's go to the passage that this idea comes out of, and let's see whether we can figure out exactly what is meant by what is said. Uh, the, the common text that this comes out of, of course, is 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. So in order to be able to do this properly, what I'd like to do is read with you uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 14. Uh, it's important to set the context for this particular passage. So let me read it with you out of the New American Standard, which I have right in front of me here. So listen carefully, and if you do have a, a Bible or an app open in front of you and you'd like to follow along, please do that. I'm beginning at verse 1, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, m with most of them God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. And let's see how Paul deals with that. Now, he says in verse 6, these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Don't be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immor immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Now, verse 13 is the text from which we generally cultivate the idea that God never gives us more than we can handle. Listen carefully. 
No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way, the way of escape, not a way of escape, but take note, the way of escape also, so that you'll be able to endure it. And let me add one more verse, verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, uh, flee from idolatry. So that's the text that this verse, verse 13, comes out of. And it's verse 13 that we often get the idea that God will never give us more than we can handle. So what's happening in these 14 verses? Well, let's, first of all, let's, let's say a word about the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was a, a very spiritually undisciplined and immature congregation. Uh, they seemed to get themselves entangled in all kinds of problems. And uh, they were saved people, but they were very immature in their faith. And so they took all kinds of poor teaching in that caused strife and rampant sin to be part of their fellowship. Uh, in some ways, uh, 1 Corinthians is not a particularly positive letter, although it is very positive in the sense that Paul encourages them toward a deeper and more thorough and consistent understanding of their relationship with Jesus and then to apply that to their Christian life and their relationship to each other and their relationship to the Lord. And, and among the problems that the Corinthian church suffered from was the problem of idolatry. That is, they, they were bringing idol worship into their worship of God and they were mixing the two together. And of course, that was leading them astray in all kinds of very, very difficult and, and hurtful ways. And so Paul, using the example of the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, that's what he's talking about in verses 1 to 14. He's, he's basing everything he's saying in verses 1 to 14 on the example of Israel at Mount Sinai after they've been released from Egypt, after they've come through the desert, and now they've gathered at Mount Sinai to enter into a covenant relationship with God and to hear his instruction. And so Paul, using the example of the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, talks to the Corinthian church about what they, in fact, are doing. So let's think for a moment about Israel. Israel, as they waited for Moses to come down from the mountain, decided that it would be a good thing, a good idea, to make a golden calf out of their jewelry. And of course, as you know the, the story, it was Aaron and some of the other leaders that were with Israel at that point. They, they, they gathered all of this material and they, they crafted a golden calf and they set it before the people and the people actually began to celebrate it and to worship it. Uh, you need to remember that the golden calf isn't a new invention. Uh, the idea of the golden calf followed Israel out of Egypt. And uh, the problem is that what Israel did is while they were at Mount Sinai and in the absence of Moses, they thought this was a good idea and they integrated it into their worship of God. And in fact, they, be able, they began to celebrate its presence. Now, that's why Paul quotes Exodus 32 verse 4 in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 14. He, he just simply notes that the people sat down to eat and to drink and they stood up to play. In other words, they were, they were deeply involved in the celebration of this golden calf. Now it's kind of intriguing that you'd think that this was the only place that the golden calf showed up was in Exodus 32 and verse 4, but uh, in, our, in our last trip to Israel, uh, we actually went up to northern Israel to, the, to a place called the city of Dan. It's the place where the tribe of Dan settled. Now, that's not the place that they were given by virtue of their, their division of the land uh, concerning uh, Joshua. But that's where Dan wound up. They should have been closer to Jerusalem over toward the Mediterranean. But where they wound up was actually in northern Israel, close to Caesarea Philippi. And so I've been to that place, the city of Dan. And it's fascinating because if you go to Dan and you read the text in Judges, you discover that some 750 years after Mount Sinai, once again, that golden calf shows up. But here it shows up in the city of Dan, and it's brought right into the temple of the Lord, as, as, which was created as an alternate worship site to Jerusalem. And so the people of Dan set up this alternate worship site 
thinking that they can they can prevent people from going down to Jerusalem, just sort of keeping them at home and, um, and sort of gratifying themselves that way. And so this golden calf shows up some 750 years later. So that idea never really leaves Israel in a significant way, but it's always playing around in their back of their mind. So when Israel gets to Mount Sinai, you have to realize that the golden calf wasn't a new invention. It actually followed them from Egypt and it created quite a problem for them. And that's what Paul identifies in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 8. And he's just simply pointing out to the Corinthian church how the people embrace this golden calf and, and, and the kind of frivolity and the kind of celebration that they entered into because of this golden calf. And it was causing all kinds of problems for them. Now, it's interesting that, that Paul's warning is very clear and to the point out of this example of Israel at Mount Sinai. Uh, he reminds the Corinthians that God wasn't happy with Israel and that the Corinthians shouldn't follow their example. Uh, in fact, verse 8 is rather pointed indeed, as Paul says that Israel acted immorally in their worship of the calf. Uh, this is quite possibly a comparative reference reminding the Corinthians of their own idolatry involved, that their own in acts of idolatry involved immorality in their worship as well. And as Paul suggests here, Israel's and the Corinthians' worship of idols seems to be running a parallel course. Uh, he's reminding Israel, the Corinthian church of Israel's problems at Mount Sinai, and he's saying to them, listen, if you look at what the Israelites were doing at Mount Sinai, and if you think about what you're doing here in terms of idolatry, you'd better think pretty carefully because the two are running pretty close together. And then out of that example of Mount Sinai, Paul reminds them in a very pointed way of um, God's response to this rampant, disobedient worship that Israel was involved in. Well, for example, look at verse 8. Um, he says, Nor let us act immorally as some of them did. All right. So he's again, he's making that parallel. And what happened? How did God respond to that? Look at verse 8. 23,000 fell in one day. And of course, in verse 9, nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, and they were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. So between verses 8 and 10, you notice that, that in each case, Israel somehow was very disobedient in their idolatry. They were very disobedient in their worship of the Lord by bringing in this idolatry, and it caused them to act immorally. It caused them to test the Lord. And that isn't a good thing in this case. Uh, they, they tested the Lord and in fact they grumbled and in each case you can see a response from the Lord. In one case 23,000 fell in one day. In another case the serpents caused a problem. And in the other case the destroyer was involved. So in each case Israel acted in a way that was contrary to the instruction that God gave them and they were disobedient in their worship and this caused God to respond to them in a way that was very definitive and uh, very decisive. Now you might think that this sort of paints God in a very bad light but you have to remember that God is good. He's perfect, he's righteous, he's holy and he's just. And so when God responds this way to Israel uh, he's responding out of holiness and he's jealous for his people and he doesn't want his people distracted from their worship of him in any way whatsoever. And so when God responds this way, his anger is at their sin. And so he's, he's protecting holiness, he's protecting, jealously protecting his people. And so this is a cleansing action on his part. And it seems rather harsh on, on our God's part, according to our understanding, our way of thinking about things. But you have to remember that this comes from the heart of a holy God who jealously loves his people and wants his people to completely focus on him. Now, this is a sad episode concerning Israel. And uh, it's to act as a very important reminder in the life of the Corinthian church. Uh, verses 11 and 12 s tell us that it, it's this whole thing is to act as an example for them that they are to think about carefully and to learn from. Look at verses 11 and 12. Now these things happened to them as an example. In other words, 
the Corinthian church is to pay careful attention to what Israel did and to how God responded to Israel. So he says, now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. In other words, Paul is saying, you know, we're getting closer to the end of, of the ages. We're getting closer to the return of the Lord. So you really want to think about your behavior and how you're worshiping the Lord and how you're functioning as a congregation. Uh, so he says out of verse 12, Therefore, it's a bit of a conclusion, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. In other words, use this as a learning example. And if you think you're doing okay, just just pay attention to this, pay careful attention to this, because you might notice some things about yourself here that you want to, to take action on and be careful with. By the way, this is a good place to stop and to remind each one of us of the immense value of the Old Testament for us as New Testament believers. There are folks today who seem to have this impression that really the Old Testament plays no real role in our life. But as Paul clearly teaches in verses 1 to 14 in 1 Corinthians 10, the Old Testament plays a very key role in, in instructing us as believers because it reminds us very um, vividly about who God is. It reminds us very vividly of who we are. And it reminds us very vividly of how our relationship with God is designed to work. And so uh, for those believers who seem to think that the Old Testament contributes nothing more to our life than, say, 150 Psalms, maybe some of the Proverbs, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, the entire Old Testament is written for our instruction. It is filled with story after story after story that reminds us about God, us, and how we relate to him. So it plays a very, very important role in our life. And that's simply what Paul is reminding Israel of here in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 14. It's in this context that Paul makes the statement that is so often misquoted and misunderstood by believers. Let's, let's read verse 13 again, just to make sure we're understanding. It's out of verses 1 to 12 that Paul says this, No temptation has overtaken you. Of course, that's in reference to everything that's gone before. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape. Once again, take careful note of that. Uh, when I type this out for myself uh, in my set of notes here before you, I, I very quickly uh, typed out verse 13, and I absentmindedly put in a way of escape, and that's not what the text says. The text says the way of escape also that you will be able to endure it. Now, the reason that that article, the, is very important there is because it indicates that Paul is talking about and thinking about a particular way of escape. Not just some random way of escape, but a particular way of escape. So, as we go back to verses 1 to 12, as you can plainly see, the context of our particular verse 13 centers on our being tempted to evil as Israel was at Mount Sinai. Uh, verse 13 makes several important statements about this temptation that every believer needs to consider carefully. So let's, let's consider what Paul says in verse 13 about temptations. Now, again, going back to verses 1 to 12, Israel was tempted to evil at Mount Sinai. They were tempted to make the golden calf, and unfortunately they fell to that temptation, and it caused them all kinds of problems. But here are the things I want us to think about. What Paul says in verse 13 is very important for us. First of all, he says that temptations are a common problem. Again, look at verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. So Paul is simply reminding them of whether it's Israel at Mount Sinai in the Old Testament or it's you folks here in the Corinthian church, uh, common, temptations are common to every one of us, no matter whether you're way back there or whether you're at Paul's time in the present in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So the point is that we are constantly tempted to evil by the devil to disobey God. That's a common part of our experience on this side of eternity until the Lord returns. So that's the first thing I want you to take note of. 
The second thing I want you to notice is that Paul says that God is faithful. Although temptations are very common to man, in the context of this commonality of our temptations, we have a faithful God who loves us and cares about us and watches over us. And so what I want to simply point out here is that God knows that we are tempted to evil by the evil one, and these things don't escape his notice. That's critically important. Uh, when I think about these things, I think about the line in the Lord's Prayer. When we say to the Lord, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I've heard of a particular interpretation of that particular part of the Lord's Prayer that, uh, that simply says, Lord, don't abandon us to our temptation but deliver us from evil. I, I kind of think in some ways that's a good way to think about that particular verse. Don't abandon us to our temptations. And of course, clearly we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that God doesn't abandon us to our temptations, but in our temptations provides for us the way of escape. So you need to remember that God notices and knows about the temptations that are common to every one of us. And then, of course, the third thing, which we've already talked about here, but I'll reinforce here once again, God supplies the escape route, the way of escape, so that we'll be able to endure the temptation to evil and not fall to it. Now, I want you to notice those two words, escape and endure. The escaping is not simply to get out of it. The escape is designed to help us endure it and to get through it. And so that's important to remember as well. And again, I want to emphasize that Paul talks about the way of escape. He's not thinking about something random. He's thinking about something very particular. The problem for us is that many readers don't think that Paul defines or illustrates the escape route. You know, you kind of read verse 13, and, and of course, verse 14 starts a new paragraph. And so at the end of verse 13, we read, you know, the, he, he provides the way of escape also that you'll be able to endure it. And then we kind of stop thinking there. But it's in the next verse, I think, that Paul provides us with the, the illustration or the definition of the escape route or the way of escape. Look what he says in verse 14. He says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Uh, the escape route, I think, is defined and illustrated in verse 14. Uh, but how does one flee idolatry when it is such a common thing that we face every day? Uh, we seem to be immersed by temptations to walk away from God's instruction, to disobey God. So how does, where does one flee to if you're constantly surrounded by all of these common temptations? Well, I can think of two examples, I think, that illustrate what Paul is talking about here. The first one comes out of the Garden of Eden. I want you to go back with me to Genesis chapter 3 for a moment. I, I want us to think about the circumstances that Eve faces in the Garden of Eden when she's tempted by the evil one. So here I'm going to read just a couple of past verses for you in, in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, listen carefully as I read. Uh, now the serpent was more crafty than any piece, beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, the middle of the garden, God said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, or you will die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, I'm sorry, uh, the serpent said to the woman, Surely you will not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave it also to her husband uh, with her, and he ate. And of course, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Now, let's think about this idea of being tempted. Now, we know, of course, in Genesis chapter 3, in the first couple of verses, that the, the evil one, the serpent, comes along and he tempts Eve to disobey God. 
uh, just like he tempted Israel to disobey him, God at Mount Sinai. Um, the evil one comes along to even says, has God really said? So, so God had already instructed Eve on what she should do in the garden. Adam and Eve were free to eat from any of the trees of the garden except for this one. So God's instruction was very, very clear. And so the evil one comes along and he tempts Eve with, has God really said? And of course, Eve kind of misquotes what God said. God did say, don't eat from it. But Eve goes on to say, don't eat from it or don't touch it and you will die. Well, she was right on two parts, don't eat of it or you'll die. But she adds this third piece, which was incorrect. And of course, the evil one's temptation, it doesn't say anything about the, in the text about the relentlessness of this temptation, but I'm sure the evil one was relentless in, her, in his temptation of Eve. And so he relentlessly tempts her, and eventually she gives in to the temptation, and she falls to sin, she eats from the fruit of the tree, and of course she gives it to Adam, and they both fall. So, so I want you to think about that particular example with regard to fleeing temptation, fleeing idolatry. Uh, I want you to notice, first of all, that God allows Eve to be tempted. God was there. He knew that Eve was being tempted, and he allowed the evil one to tempt Eve. The serpent had his opportunity, but Eve isn't required to follow the serpent's temptation, is she? She chooses to follow the temptation, which tells us something about the nature of temptation. Uh, temptation doesn't come along as an ugly, hideous monster that we would recognize as temptation right off the hop, but rather it comes along as something that is, as uh, Moses points out in Genesis 3, something that is pleasing to the eye, something that makes us feel good, something that sort of um, uh, speaks to us in a very positive way. And so temptation is often very dis de hidden in the context of something that seems very pleasurable or good. But Eve isn't required to follow the serpent's temptation. She chooses to follow it. But in this, does she have an escape route? Does she have the way of escape? I think she does. Her escape route is the one supplied by God who is faithful. Her escape route is to flee idolatry by remaining faithful to God's instruction and not giving in to the temptation. That's her escape route. She could have come back to the evil one and she could have said to him, no, God has said, don't eat or we will die, so I'm not going to go there. But instead, she misquotes, and in the, in the evil one's continuing or relentless temptation, he convinces her to fall to the temptation, of course, to fall to sin. We need to remember that Eve didn't flee into God's faithfulness. That is his instruction. She fell to temptation, and she didn't endure. So I want you to think about that as a way of illustrating what Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Uh, temptation, as it was for Eve, is a very common uh, experience for every one of us. The evil one lurks in the back of every one of our lives, day in and day out, uh, coming to us with the idea, has God really said? And so it causes us to doubt. And when we doubt, we listen to the temptation further. And, of course, we walk into the temptation and we follow through to the sin that follows the temptation and we don't endure. So that's one example. But then there's the other example that I want to share with you this afternoon. And that comes out of Matthew chapter 4. And that's a good comparative to Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. So let's, let's turn back to Matthew chapter 4 for just a moment. And let's, uh, let's take note of what Matthew writes there. Of course, this story is the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. And let me read these verses with you. There are 11 of them. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter, interesting the way Matthew calls him, the tempter came 
and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Of course, there, Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus, of course, replies, Jesus said to him, On the other hand is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That's Deuteronomy 6.16. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Again, that is Jesus quoting Deuteronomy 6.13. It's interesting that in verse 11, it concludes with this. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Now, I want you to compare those two stories, Genesis chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 4. And note the differences between the stories. Again, let me make these comments. I want you to notice, first of all, that God allows his son to be tempted by the devil, just like Eve in the Garden of Eden. And the devil, I'm sorry, the devil is relentless in his tempting of Jesus to fall to temptation. You notice that the devil comes to Jesus again and again and again. And you need to remember that Jesus is tired and he's hungry. So that would make the nature of these temptations very, very challenging to try to overcome. Jesus was in a difficult position. But I want you to notice that once again, God is faithful in supplying his son with the escape route. And he takes it. You notice that every time that the evil one, the devil, the tempter, as Matthew calls him, comes to Jesus with a temptation, instead of falling to the temptation, following the voice of the tempter, the evil one, Satan, Jesus chooses the escape route, the way of escape. And that is to come back to the faithfulness of God's instruction and to stay in it time and time and time again. That's why Jesus uh, quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8, Deuteronomy chapter 6 twice in that particular, 16 and verse 13 in that passage. So with every temptation that the evil one throws at Jesus, Jesus always comes back with the word of God and I believe that is the escape route, the, the way of escape. That's how Jesus flees what the devil is doing. And it's interesting in verse 11, as I pointed out before, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. I think in my mind, that's an interesting way of sort of capsulizing what it says at the end of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, so that you will be able to endure it. Jesus endured the temptations. The devil left and Jesus was ministered to by angels. So I want you to notice that, that what Jesus does in contrast to Eve in the garden is that he flees into God's word and he stays faithful to his instruction and he endures. And now I want to say a word about temptation, this word you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. The word that Paul uses in chapter 10, verse 13, can be used of God testing one's faith so as to refine and purify it, but it can also be used of the devil to cause one to fall into sin. The difference is always that of context. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the context seems to be, very clearly, a temptation to fall to sin. Now, <clears throat> Does that mean that when Jesus, or when God tempts, or when God tests our faith to refine and purify it, that we will never fall into temptation toward uh, perhaps a want to sin? Well, it can certainly happen. When God tests our faith, you have to remember that the evil one is also paying attention. So that when God is testing our faith, the evil one may want to come in from the side and say, listen, this test obviously 
um, makes it clear that God doesn't love you because if God loved you, he would never test you this way. So he tempts us to move off into, into disobedience. And the interesting thing that is that even here, God provides the way of escape. The way of escape in this situation is to remain faithful to God's word even though our faith is tested, and sometimes in very significant ways. So I want you to keep that in mind. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the issue is temptation that can lead us into falling into sin. So when we face the various kinds of temptation that are common to all people, God is faithful to provide us the way of escape. And that way is to flee the temptation by running to his instruction and staying faithful to it. I think that's what Paul means when he says in verse 14, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. What Israel should have done at Mount Sinai is flee from idolatry. They should have run away from this calf. They should have stayed faithful to God's word. And they should have just ignored whatever that calf was and to go on with their life. And so it's important that they remain faithful to what God's instruction has said to them. Um, God is faithful to provide the way of escape. And that is, of course, as I just said, to flee from the temptation by running to his instructions and to stay faithful to it. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament are full of God's good instruction that offer us the opportunity to obey and to find blessing. In other words, to be able to endure the temptations that we face. Now, again, just a word, does this mean that temptations are easy to deal with? Well, absolutely not. Both Eve and Jesus faced relentless and concentrated efforts by the devil to have them submit and to fall to his temptations. The critical difference is that one ran to God's way of escape, the other one didn't. One endured and one didn't. So when we face temptation today, let's make sure that we're running in the right direction, which means that God's instruction, what he's given us in his word, is critically important for us to get into our lives so that we find that way of escape in all of the circumstances that we face. God's instruction is designed for us to find life and joy and blessing. And as long as we stay within the context of that, uh, we will certainly find God's blessing and joy. Um, so when we face temptation today, let's make sure we're running in the right direction. And if we do fall to sin because of temptation, there is an important passage for us in the New Testament as well, for it reminds us of God's faithfulness even here as well. First uh, John chapter 1, verse 10 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I simply want to remind us that, that, that God has given us the way of escape when we face temptations that are going to want to cause us to fall to evil. And that is to listen to his instruction and to obey it and to follow it, to flee from what is in front of us that might cause us to disobey God. The Corinthians needed to flee from their idolatry and they were in danger of not fleeing. And so God, or Paul reminds them, pay attention to Israel. Pay attention to yourself. Pay attention to what God has said. Because he is faithful and he has given us the way of escape. The God who is faithful and right cleanses us and makes us right with him when we confess our sin before him. That's the encouragement that, uh, that we have should we fall to temptation. If we come to God, we're willing to come to God to confess our sins before him, he is both faithful and righteous to cleanse us from our sins and to set us aright with him. So that's my encouragement for you today. So wherever you find yourself in terms of living your life, uh, surrounded by temptation all around, uh, make sure you're listening to God's instruction for in his instruction, we have the way of escape. And that way of escape is to stay faithful and true to his instruction and to obey it and to enjoy the blessings and the joy that come from it. So that's my encouragement for you for today. I uh, hope you have a real good rest of your day and uh, just enjoy worshiping the Lord. It's been good to be with you. We'll talk to you next Thursday again. Thanks so much for being here. Bye-bye.